been terrific, Kevin. It's been a while. I think the last time I spoke with you was a documentary. I, I got a monster, right? Correct. Correct. How have you been? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. And wonderful. You 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 went to a, you know, some some a documentary like I got a monster to something uh, much more narrative like Marisol. Tell tell us uh, how did this came about for you and why did you want to uh, direct a Marisol? Yeah, I mean, um, well, first, I'm, I'm Mexican American. I'm second generation. My family on my mother's side is from San Antonio, Texas. They have a long line of activists within the Latino community that uh, populates that that side of the family. So I grew up very familiar with these types of stories. I saw my uncle pick people up in El Paso and, and take them to safe areas and um, it was just a world that I was I was familiar with and it wasn't exotic or weird to me. It was very much of my cultural upbringing. So with that in mind, I was looking for a way to make my first fiction film and partnered with this really wonderful screenwriter who had a, a similar passion for the types of stories involved in what we were discussing. It originated in a much different iteration of the film. My producer always wanted to do a, a remake of a movie called The Legend of Billie Jean, which was sort of a 80s cult classic with Helen Slater and Christian Slater and the kernel of that story evolved into this and as we were trying to transpose it to to modern day we realized that we couldn't be as cavalier with some of the tonal and structural elements that that movie had it, it, it was the 80s so things were a bit different then <laughs> and as we dug into it I just really wanted to do a version that tried to represent this as culturally and accurately as possible um, I knew these houses, I knew these locations growing up, I knew what it felt like to be in these communities, so I wanted to show it properly and not do an overly glamorized version of it. And uh, yeah, this little movie popped out. I'm really excited about it. Well, a film, a film like this is always timely. I mean, it's, it's an issue that won't go away, but... It seems it seems like uh, you know you coming off these uh, documentaries. You you always tell us about your your enjoyment of your your link to social commentary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I never I never realized I had one. Um, and then we just finished a, a, another film that was about the Afghan refugee crisis that came out of our withdrawal from Afghanistan. So I I, I guess the the thing that I I've always been an emotional person and these things strike me these stories emotionally i get very frustrated at at what's going on and i guess this is my way of having the conversation in a constructive way and utilizing a you know a skill set that i have which is you know where to put a camera and how to stitch together some footage so it, it was something that i think um feels in a lot of ways very consistent with who i am and also as my wife always points out, when are you going to do a comedy? Because you're always cracking jokes and want to have a good time too. But every time I sit down and I begin the process, this other side comes out and I guess I just like to crusade a little bit for lack of a better term. I, I want to remark, I think that it's because you have this strong side of empathy. That's why you make these type of films. Oh, uh, well, thank you. That's very generous of you. Now, of course, you know, some sometimes when you uh, you watch a movie like this, there's always like the, those uh, those type of debates that come comes out of or discussions out of the film like this. Um, talk about the discussions about the process of dreamers, because that's I guess that's always a confusing thing for, yeah. for people today. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it still is. And I'm, and unfortunately, the. The political machine is always keeping this in a very evolving discussion. One day somebody can be in office and has a different agenda with what's going on. The next day, a completely new agenda and then battles from both sides. But basically the notion is that there's young people that have the ability to get um, citizenship in our country if they go through a certain process. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of people aren't aware of the specific specifics of that and what they need to do to get into that process. And as we discovered in our research, it becomes that age of 18 where it really becomes a dividing line, whether you can get in and do what needs to be done to eventually get that citizenship or you cannot. And at that time, if you're here as an adult in the country, the available um, 
recourse that you have to try to become a citizen changes dramatically. So for our main character, we wanted to put her on this dividing line and um, tell the story of something that we discovered in a research where a lot of people, when they get to a lot of young adults, that 16, 17 year old age, they get faced with this reality of, of what their backstory is when they're trying to get their first driver's license, when they're applying to college, when they're applying to their first job and they need proper, you know, anything, a birth certificate, a social security card to show that they are actually citizens in the States and get faced with this really uh, unfortunate reality where they discover that they're not. So, um, yeah, I mean, the Dreamer program is phenomenal, but it also is something that people need to be aware of so that they can get into it. Otherwise, it's not posting benefits for people that reflect our character Marisol. So how did you want to approach uh, telling this uh, story of Marisol? Because uh, in its own way, it's 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 a sad story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I hope that people can see some optimism in it just in the sense that you have this young girl who still invariably wants to contribute and be a better version of herself in the world so even though the outcome is is sad i i, I hope that people can see based on the character work we did with our, our main character that there is an optimism if you allow these people the opportunity that we can see people really contribute in a wonderful way um, but as far as the approach to it, you know, coming from documentary, I very much felt that we needed to try to make this as authentic and realistic as possible. We all use, we use real locations. Everything for the most part was accurate to what you would see in a story of this nature, the towns that we filmed out of the houses. We cast as many people as we could that hadn't acted before and tried to give it a really authentic flavor. A lot of the films that I really responded to growing up and as a filmmaker, you know, led the lines between fiction and nonfiction, even in the fiction space. So I wanted to embrace a bit of that neo-realist approach and, and try to really make it feel as authentic as possible. And that was our mandate, you know, whenever the question was, what do you want to put in this room? I said, well, what was here originally? What was the, how was this room initially set up? Let's remove or add some slight stuff, but try to keep it as real as possible. So, yeah, I mean, from the approach, it was always to ground it and try to make it authentic and, and hopefully it comes across on screen. Now, I'm going to rewind a little bit of something that you actually said is because uh, you said you wanted to cast people who have never acted before. How mm -hmm. did you see that as, a, as, a, as an advantage for a film like this? It, you, you just, yeah. The, you just didn't want to use professional actors or you felt like th them with no experience is more realistic? I, a combination of both. I, I believe that we can probably get a much more natural, authentic performance with somebody that didn't have a huge amount of tricks up their sleeves or mannered reactions to stuff. And then also I wanted this person to feel unique and individual and not if you've seen this person before, we invariably bring baggage to that performance if we've seen them in other stuff. And I want people to say like, oh my God, this is a real human being. This is a real person. And that was sort of the driving force behind it. Uh, we got incredibly lucky with our lead actress. This was the first thing she ever auditioned for. The second thing she ever acted in, the first thing was she was in a Christmas pageant at her local church. So she basically st stood and ornamentation for I think 12 hours <laughs> but she never formally gave dialogue or anything and I think her performance in this is incredible I could not have been happier with the outcome of, of what she gave to it and what she brought a lot of overlap with her life and and part of Marisol's as well so it was a place she can access emotionally and and I really she delivered in ways we couldn't expect so, Kevin, how how do you direct uh, non-experienced actors like this to draw out the right emotions? I, I, I'm just getting to the fact that, you know, lots of experienced actors have the experience to draw out these certain type of emotions. But you manage to draw draw it out uh, pretty easy amongst the entire cast, including Esmeralda. Well, thank you. And also, I really did not do anything. I showed up. I talked to them about the scene. The kids that played the the three main kids, Mia, Max, and Esme, they were so gifted and so savvy and so smart. 
and all cinephiles, I mean, you know, they would watch Criterion extras and they knew info about movies that I, I mean, I'm a film geek and these kids easily kept up and knew more than I did in a lot of places. So they came with a great understanding of the medium. Um, Theo Taplitz, who played, you know, unfortunately, our, I guess our bad guy in the film, he was a very seasoned actor and he's a director and filmmaker as well. So he as well intuitively understood the craft. So I didn't really have to do much. We would block things and I would talk to them about it a little bit. I would always ask if they have questions. They very seldom did. And we just roll. And I guess for me, the major thing that I always tried to do is to shoot quickly to keep their energy up and then to um, just get out of the way and let them bring what they wanted to. We did a lot of improvising with the dialogue. I always gave them the freedom out of things that didn't feel like it was natural for them to speak, to go off page and make it their own. And, you know, Esme in particular had never had access with emotion. There's a, a long steady cam shot in the film where Ice raids one of the places that she's in. This is a bit of a spoiler if you guys haven't seen it. And it's about five and a half minutes and we're watching her run and, you know, evade ice. And at the end of the shot, she begins to cry. And this is after about four minutes of us shooting the shot. And I think we did 13 takes and every one of those takes, she was point on at that moment to the point where I was like, I, I, this is unbelievable. I mean, <laughs> how much can I go back to the well? And every time I thought maybe she couldn't do it again, she nailed it. And, you know, the take in the movie shows how incredible a moment of performance that is. Now, you, you brought up a good point is the uh, cinematography, um, because I was going to ask you about uh, how you wanted to shoot this film, especially with the colorization of the film, because uh, it's a stark difference from, uh, you know, your previous work, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, this to me was a very throwback aesthetic. We shot on Super 16, so we shot on film. We used anamorphic Super 16 lenses, which are incredibly rare. And the benefit of them is that it gives you that um, intimate Super 16 feel, while at the same time giving you the ability to shoot anamorphic so we can lean into the landscape elements of what Texas, you know, has as a backdrop, which is pretty spectacular. So from the beginning, we wanted to ground it in a very throwback style. Um, the Maisel brothers are documentarians that I love. They shot their stuff on film. To me, it's very much uh, a reference to the direct cinema approach of them and D.A. Pennybaker, Haskell Wexler. He shot a movie called Medium Cool, which uh, was a combination of staged and um, authentic events that he implanted real actors into. So we always wanted to have that that approach and our DP, I went to AFI with him. I've known him for God close to 20 years at this point is an American an amazing shooter. He could not have been happier to get his light meter out and shoot on film. So from the beginning, we decided to really attack it from a throwback sort of approach and um, yeah, we watched it in this, the theater the other day screening and everybody came back to me and they're like, oh my God, film, it felt so good to see something shot on film. So it's good that that's landing for people. <laughs> Most excellent. Yes, absolutely. And, um, and um, you know, in a subject matter like this, a lot of people, you know, try to bring in, you know, uh, friends, allies or villains in this case. And you and you brought in sort of like the underground, like railroad network or mm -hmm. he's on one side. And then you have, uh, you know, um, patriots in, in you know, on, on the on the web, you know, advocating for the wall or or yeah. whatnot. Uh, tell tell us about bringing those both sides and perspectives into this film and how you want to basically approach and balance the, um, the two sides. Yeah, it was really tricky. Justin, who, you know, unfortunately is our face of the dark side of the story. Um, we tried our best, even within the context of what you see, to try to remind people that he's a young kid who's getting a lot of bad direction and didn't want to make him just feel like he was a born evil racist zealot who was just out for people he was listen teenagers being a teenager is really challenging and if you don't have people pointing you in the right direction or enforcing a more compassionate outlook it's very easy to get swept up in and some of these other things so it was always a conscious decision by the writer in particular to try to to make him seem as unscary as possible within how scary his behavior was becoming 
and our actor, I think, did a great job of, of adding to that and trying to uh, or making him more human, I think, than it could have been played. Um, so that was always a very important part of the story. As far as the other part, you know, I once again come from an activist family. I've seen my uncle pick people up in El Paso at the border, get out of a rider truck at a Home Depot and hop into our van and, and take them to safe passage. So I understood that version very well and um, it was something that I saw family do multiple times. So in that regard, I felt like you had to also represent the hope element of this because there is an infrastructure that supports people going through this and there are people that want to help and are people that want to support. And even though we see these headlines that talks about, you know, I just pulled something on when I was waiting for before you came on just quickly and you know, Tucker Carlson is now attacking Greg Abbott for not doing enough at the Texas border. And this guy has been like almost demonic in the way that he's been handling it. And for some people, it's still not enough. So everything is getting grossly politicized. And I want to show also that people within that are also doing good and trying to make this a more humane situation. Yeah, that that is just the political times of uh, what we're actually living in. Yeah. Um, now, now I do I do have one one big question, but I don't want you to reveal it. Uh, but just tell just tell me why did you choose the ending for for this movie? Okay. Yeah, we wrestled with it a lot, and we shot a bunch of different variations. And getting to whatever felt like a very wrapped up solution to the ending felt inauthentic. And I don't know if I can quite my put my finger on why, but what we eventually realized was that the problem is the system, right? So the outcome irrelevant what's going on, it's the system that is still causing the emotional duress on this character. So she had to go through everything because the systems in place where she didn't feel like she had solutions or options or the opportunity to, to try to find a good outcome. So once we get to that final point, it felt pretty irrelevant as to what happened because the damage has already been done. Even if things turn out well, this burden of her experience is something she's going to have to carry and will color how she sees our country regardless. And if it doesn't, obviously that would as well. So for us, those points afterwards felt a little bit irrelevant once we got to that emotional point. Most excellent. And one, one last thought before I, I leave you, Kevin, is uh, now you have a taste of the narrative side. Are you are you going back to documentaries again or? Yeah, we actually just wrapped up a documentary that I'm really proud of about um, that chronicles the leading factors of the Afghan refugee crisis when we withdrew from Afghanistan. So that one will in the process of talking to a distributor and that should be coming out hopefully within the next few weeks. And then I'm actually in production on another documentary and this one's a lighter one. This is about the history of Las Vegas music told through the side musicians and the supporting performers over the past 60 years or 20 feet from stardom meets Ocean's Eleven type of a feel to it. So that at least gets to show up in the edit and talk about music and happy stories as opposed to uh, some of these more challenging ones. Well, you know, we always enjoy uh, your social commentary in, in, into these type of films. So, oh, Kevin, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for getting this conversation uh, with me. And um, I'm certain I'm certain you're going to talk to me again. I'd love that. Thank you so much for your time again. Really appreciate it. Hey, not a problem. Next time. Kevin. Sounds good. Bye -bye.